Thank you very much for uh, tuning in and being here. And thank you very much, DIFC, um, for this opportunity. Um, today's session is going to be about uh, investor readiness for, for startups um, and, and all the processes and, uh, and things that you should be concentrating on and doing before you actually sit down and get in front of investors. Um, with me today, we have Rohit, who's the uh, founder of Ten Leaves, uh, a tech driven consultancy company um, specialized in, in establishing companies and getting them um, through the DIFC system up to uh, regulatory authorization. And then we have Visha with us, uh, our, our legal expert. Uh, he's a lawyer by trade, he's a partner at uh, Ten Leaves. Uh, and along with that, he sits on the board of many companies uh, as a board member and independent board member um, with a specialization, I would say, in, in fund structuring. Um, so any, any funds that wish to come to the DIFC and go through that uh, process, he, he's the man. And uh, we have our special guest today, Igor. Uh, <coughs> Igor's uh, been in portfolio management, asset management for over 10 years. Um, he led the, um, the, the largest uh, post-Soviet um, brokerage company to its uh, NASDAQ listing. It's Freedom Finance, right? Freedom Holding, yeah. Freedom Holding. And uh, he is now in retirement, so he tells me. I believe it's more semi-retirement. He's uh, in the midst of uh, starting a fund um, investment structure within the DIFC so, uh, yeah. and uh, investing in local startups in the region. Um, as for me... Uh, my name is Derek. I'm the founder of N2 Technology. Uh, I started in finance uh, way back in the, uh, the 90s um, for an American bank as a prop trader. Um, and in the late 90s, I started uh, a hedge fund uh, based out of Geneva, Switzerland, which I ran all the way through the uh, financial crisis and sold it eventually in 2012. Um, through the latter years of that uh, of that hedge fund, I was investing in uh, in a whole bunch of startups, mentoring those guys. Um, and when I eventually sold that business, I moved full time onto what I like to call the bright side of the business, speaking with interesting founders, um, helping them, mentoring them. Um, and uh, and through that time, or through the, the yeah after that time, I was always asked the question by startup founders. Can you help us raise capital? And I guess it's one of the one of the needs of every single founder. There's not a lot. There's not a lot going to happen unless you've got capital to uh, to uh, build that vision um, out there. Uh, and when I got into that that market, thinking it was going to be a re relatively easy job after having raised money for a hedge fund and been working in public markets, uh, I came to the realization that it's uh, incredibly difficult. It's completely fragmented. Um, founders are, of course, completely inexperienced in uh, uh, in going out and, and speaking the right language and getting everything in order for it. Um, and from the VC side, um, it seems a, a, a bit of a fragmented mess as well. Um, so that's that's why we built N2. There'll be a little bit more on that, but we'll get into the the crooks of what today is about, which is uh, how founders should prepare themselves and get ready. Uh, um, to go out and meet investors and get all their ducks in a row. Um, so the main elements that we'll be concentrating on are these five steps, which is essentially getting those those documents um, in, in order. Uh, and a lot of that is to do with the legal work, the compliance work, the financial work, uh, and then leading to your 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 business plan to draw it up. So what we'll I'll hand over for a moment for uh, to 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 Bisha, um, just to go through what those legals are, what what you should be looking at in terms of you know founder agreements, shareholder agreements, how the DIFC works for us um, to help us along that. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's a crucial element, and that's really the basis. I think of any any proper corporate governance, and to if you want to get investors on board, uh, people often ask me uh, how does my structure need to look like uh, in order to attract investors. It really depends on the investor, but what is, I think, important and is, is global is that you need the proper structure in place, the right license in place. You've made your research before that the license that I have is the license that I need for my activity. Is it a regulated activity? Is it a non-regulated activity? Uh, is, am, I, uh, am I in the right zone? Am I in the right uh, kind of setup? 
once once you have that determined and you go through the setup process, uh, obviously we have uh, the articles of incorporation. It's a basic document. Uh, there are basic documents to do that, but even in the corp in the articles of incorporation, you can already uh, reflect what you need to reflect in the shareholders agreement because the shareholders agreement is what I say or some call the founder founder agreement. It is basically the same thing. It's where the shareholders of the entity agree on the terms of uh, of holding those shares and what happens. When they want to exit, uh, what happens when somebody leaves? When somebody's a bad lever, when is a good lever? Uh, because most investors, at the end of the day, they want to exit at a certain point. So if you don't agree on a proper uh, exit strategy in in the shareholders agreement and what are the terms between you, between you founders, uh, then you will have issues at at one one point of time. Uh, and I mean, we've we've seen that there's a lot of uh, different cases in uh, where where people have issues with that. Um, uh, so. So I think it's important to know uh, that once you draft the shareholders agreement is who are the founders, who are uh, the investors, uh, are, do I, am, I, am I going to have different investor rounds? It's not set in stone. That means the shareholders agreement can be amended going, for, going uh, forward, but uh, it is an important cornerstone. And when you have an investor coming in, he will ask, uh, what mm -hmm. do you have in place? Uh, do you have these set of documents in place? Other other important uh, documents, obviously, are because you are a startup. So when your main asset is uh, obviously intellectual property. Uh, so what have you created with with that entity? Uh, you've invested into uh, getting uh, your application, your uh, your data set, etc. So do you own those property rights? Uh, so you have to make sure that that you've properly assigned them to that newly established entity, and that uh, as a founder you also have kind of a protection. That means that uh, not suddenly an uh, investor comes, he overtakes the whole company, and you as a founder end up with having no uh, intellectual property rights. So, um, and then from, from there on, I think once you have those bases in place, shareholders agreement, uh, uh, intellectual property uh, rights, and the right licensing, then you have a good startup, and then you can say, what other agreements do I need? Uh, what other structures do I need to put in place for investors to be to be attractive to them? Ooh, and then you can move forward. Very good. And uh, and I think one of the things that uh, you know a lot of startups, uh, <laughs> we're, we're we're also keen on our vision and building product that we often forget, like the basics that we need to put in place and the ongoing responsibility. You know, in those very early days. When we, when we start our business, it's all about sitting down with our buddies, talking about the great ideas that we have, how we're going to take over the world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the minute we move to the next stage um, and get shareholders involved, our whole life has changed. We are now incredibly responsible um, in, in the way we act on a, on a, on a daily basis. And that your, your job of chief visionary officer, which is where we all want to leave, actually becomes jack of all trades and I need to do everything, which means changing the toilet paper. You do absolutely everything as a, a as that person. Um, but some of the easy things that you should be concentrating on, you should be looking at is how can I fill the holes? How can I make sure that I am compliant um, every single day when I get in front of investors, they can check the history of the company. Um, this is something that Rohit's an absolute specialist in. So I'll just let you talk about what all those things are. What, what what the needs are for a company on a on a weekly, monthly, um, yearly yearly basis? Well, uh, uh, Derek, uh, I think uh, we, me and Bishir have worked on quite a few startups uh, where we have seen when, uh, yes, getting the legal structure is one aspect of it. Getting the license is another aspect of it. But how do you govern the company on a going basis? When I say how do you govern the company, it's not something very complicated. As simple as who's going to do what. Uh, you have shareholders you have directors. What do the directors do? What do the shareholders do? Has it been quantified? Can you, for instance, take on new shareholders without asking the uh, existing shareholders? Uh, what rights and what responsibilities do these directors have? Usually in, in, in high growth startups, you have more shareholders coming in every single time. Do they get a board seat? Don't they get a board seat? Uh, more importantly, once you have more than five, 10 shareholders, who directs the company? Do the directors have enough, uh, uh, let's say, powers to open a bank account? A lot of times we find that that's not been defined. So all of a sudden you have 20 shareholders circulating a resolution because they want to open a bank account. Uh, if you want to do something small, but uh, what ends up happening, the founder starts thinking, do I uh, give this to the directors, this power? Will they misuse it? Or as opposed to doing everything with everybody? 
So what I've seen is there's something called shareholder reserve matters. There's something called director reserve matters. These kind of things are very important when you're governing the company. How do you have board meetings? What is the quorum? How many people come in before you say that this board meeting is 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 uh, is valid, right? Who takes the minutes? Who decides how is it recorded? Uh, the minutes register, as they call it, in legal terms, is basically should read like the legal story of the company. What happened uh, in the first month? What happened in the tenth month? What happened when uh, when you got a new person in, a new uh, a new director, new shareholder in? All this, uh, when an investor like Igor, for instance, comes in one year down the line, he should be able to see this is the story of the company. This is what happened. This was a this valuation, etc. So uh, the DIFC, for instance, is uh, has a register of companies, and there are certain things called corporate actions which you need to do at every single time. Now I have had instances where clients come in, uh, they bring in shareholders, right? They assign the shares, but they do not update the registrar. So after uh, the registrar has, I think, 30 days before you can, you have to update them within 30 days if you make a share change. Now that doesn't happen. So after sudden, after six months, the client says, hey, you know what, I've got, this is my updated cap table, but the DIFC does not have that cap table. So these are the small things where you need secretarial work, you need secretarial uh, information. Um, uh, accounting is another thing, right? A lot of people, again, uh, they concentrate on getting the product done, but they don't note down what is what is needed, and they don't realize that you have to maintain accounts, even though you don't have to submit it. Uh, for certain companies, mm. you at least maintain accounts. So I think from a legal standpoint, it sounds very, uh, a lot of founders think of this maybe as very boring things to do. It's more exciting to work on the product. It's more exciting to work on, on, on the new uh, investors coming in. But the new investor coming in is going to be looking at all this. And if you don't have that in place, then there's a problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's uh, that, that's been the biggest takeaway that, I, that I've had. Eagle, Can I please. add something to that? Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of decks. I'm sure you've had a lot of pitches. Your platform uh, deals with a lot of startups. I had a lot of people come out and say, hi, I need money. Right. And I say, well, who are you? What are you? And the one of the bigger problems that a lot of startups have that I found, a lot of them are not even ready to approach investors, even for an angel round or a seed round. They don't have a corporate structure. They don't know which country they want to belong to. Um, they don't know what kind of shareholder they're looking for. So uh, I, I, I would say that would be best to hire an advisor. It's not cheap, uh, but it's definitely worth it. Like you guys, you the, you have done a lot of structures. You've done a lot. Of, you worked with a lot of these businesses. But you know what I mean? When I come in as an investor, somebody approaches me. And it goes, we have a great product. We have a great service. I'm like, well, you do. Yeah. What's your name? My name is John Smith. Right. And I'm like, what's the company? Well, we came up with a name or we're registered in a free zone. We just have one shareholder. You're not ready for an investor. You haven't even figured out what kind of corporate structure you want to have. You have another corporate governance. So uh, for, for a startup, I would always seek advice. And, you know, the first thing I say, hire a lawyer. Right. If you want to talk about investments, shareholders, uh, I'm, I'm always trying to, uh, you know, be a good guy. And you say, well, comes to me and goes, we're ready to give you 50 percent for a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, you got to understand that from that point on, the both of us will make all the decisions in this company. You haven't thought this through. Yeah. So always hire a lawyer and uh, look, look, look for an advisory firm to help you out, figure that out. It will take some time, but like you said, it's the boring stuff, but it's absolutely necessary. 100% that yeah. you've got to build those foundations, put them in place correctly. Yeah. And it saves you just so much stress uh, uh, at the far end when you're actually in front of people, because intrinsically the system works like this. You get in front of people, you blow them away with your vision, your idea, where you're going with this. They then go backwards and diligence you. And you're now super excited because this guy's all over you, loves you, fantastic. And then they go backwards and because you haven't done one of these things, you fail. And this is the easiest thing. If you surround yourself with the right people uh, and do the donkey work at the beginning, these are the easiest things to put in place. Um, and, and the financials were not, you know, this is really hire an expert because, you know, there is no founder out there that's an expert in every single field and they should be concentrating on that. Uh, 
uh, uh, building their product, building their customer base, et cetera. Et cetera. And, and if, if I can add, I, th I think uh, you and Igor make a valid point. Uh, I think and, and that you can integrate actually in the corporate structure. So once you set up a corporate structure, you can in integrate a set of group advisors that actually advises you and that become your advisory board. You don't have to renumerate everybody uh, from, the, from the outset. You can give them shares uh, in, in, in company. That doesn't cost you much, Indeed. even if it's a small participation. But at least it shows that you have a certain, you, you, you identify which type of professionals do I want to be identified with, who can, who can help me actually to push this startup to the next level. And you can integrate that into to your corporate governance structures, go to the investors and say, OK, this is my corporate structure. This is my advisory board. And that's where and you do regular board meetings. A lot of a lot of uh, startups forget actually that they actually need board meetings to enter to to put the directors and the board advisory board, integrate them and uh, and have a corporate proper corporate structure. And, and that helps, I think, also. It helps the startup to uh, to uh, think, OK, what is my next step? What do I need to know? Because these people have been doing that for a while, so they have some experience in it. Yep. No, absolutely. And that is all that, that is all for a startup. You know what that what the last thing on here is, that business plan, what it actually all is. Uh, and I've experienced a whole bunch of startups that, uh, that come to me. They've sent decks over, and they started with the deck, 20 pages of a deck without a business plan. Um, so you're kind of working backwards. You're kind of working the wrong way. You haven't understood your business. You haven't put in all the things you need to do. Your business plan is essentially where where everything starts. Um, I mean, the way I deal with it, lots of people deal with it in different ways. I have a whole bunch of journals I write in, and this is they they come with me wherever I go, wherever I have free time, um, when I want to be slightly visionary, when I want to understand parts of the business, how I want to drive certain parts of the business. I take them with me. I write them down. I cross things out. They grow organically over time. They're very dynamic, but they they form that basis of of, of truth for yourself as a uh, as a startup, uh, as a founder. They form all those ideas because you get dragged off in all sorts of directions all the time. Come back to that. Write it down. Keep it going, and and from that, with all these advisors and all, all the help that you can get along the way, is how you'll actually form. Um, your North Star, which is your North Star, is the, the, the validation point that you're trying to read, um, bringing in every single part of your, your strategy, how you're going to become that company you wish to become. Um, and with all of this information and getting out on the road, there's obviously the big determining factor, your raise. <laughs> how much you need, who you're going to ask for it, what it's worth, what that structure is going to be. Um, of course, you've got to have prepared everything, put all your ducks in a line to understand that. Um, and there are there are uh, uh, you know a million different ways that um, that um, companies will tell you they value it. Investors will tell you they value. Um, but there are a couple of there are a couple of home truths. There's a home truth from from the BC side, um, which everyone should bear in mind. And you can just very simply use this to reverse it, engineer um, how much you should be asking for and what valuation. Um, just understanding the structure of a VC. They're a five to seven year investment platform. That's how long they've raised capital for. They need to make, on an average, they do between 18 and 27% annually. Okay. They have about a one in 10 hit rate in, in terms of success. So just work out how much do they need to make off your startup on their investment to hit their return targets that they have told their investors, they have investors, they're answerable, are going to make. So that's one way of reverse engineering and understanding um, what the sort of maximum and minimum can be. Um, the other way to do it is just to take a really honest pill and sit back uh, and not get into the nickel and diming of it's my share, it's my company and I'm selling it and I want to hold on to as much as I possibly can. It's, the, it's completely the wrong way of visualizing it as a founder. Um, the right way of visualizing it is without investor money, my dream and my product stays exactly where it is today. Zero, nothing, nothing's going to happen. So I need that money. What is the right amount of money I need and how many shares where we're all happy and I can reach that first milestone? Forget about the rest. You just need to get to that first milestone and you need X amount of money to make that happen. X amount of spend KPIs to get there. Now you have a pre, pre described valuation mechanism to use. And if that fits into the, the VC model, now you're talking. Now you can start moving forward with them. Um, 
a whole bunch of other complications, and Bish is going to help me out on, on, on this. Uh, and that is what, what instrument you use and what the dis different instruments are, whether they be preference shares, ordinary shares, convertible safes, and how, how that works in this region, how it works within the DIC. Maybe you can just uh, enlighten people about the differences. Yeah, I think uh, I think we 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 uh, the, we mentioned that I think during the last uh, session that that we are in a common law jurisdiction, which gives a lot of contractual flexibility. So we're not bound to. Uh, just outside, maybe some people don't know. Just outside, we're in a civil law jurisdiction, which is uh, which uh, is, is is a different structure. Uh, and uh, here, everything you can do actually in, in in markets like the US or the UK or other markets, you can incorporate the same here. So we have a lot of contractual liber liberties to do safe agreements that a lot of investors know from from the US or Delaware. Uh, can incorporate here. We've done that actually for quite a number of uh, uh, for uh, a number of, of clients here. I'm not so sure the market here is quite aware about uh, how it, how it works. That you have this option at a later stage. I think they prefer to actually it is actually an option, a contractual arrangement to to receive the shares in the future. But uh, but here I think the investors prefer to actually have the actual shares, and you have a shareholders agreement, and they will know what what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. But it is an option that you can do. Uh, in terms of preferred or ordinary shares, obviously we also have here quite a bit of liberty in in the, in the DIC to structure to do to give uh, the ordinary shares to everybody, to employees, etc., and then preferred shares to the ordinary and to to investors that uh, that where you give them more prefer, prefer preferential rights as opposed to those that, that are holding ordinary rights. Um, so, but I think the good news is, and without having, uh, entering too much uh, technical detail, is that there is a lot of contractual freedom here. We can work on a lot of different kind of arrangements, whether it's safe agreement, uh, preferential rights, ordinary rights, etc. But it's really sitting down and seeing what do I want to have as a structure? But what, what does my investor is asking for? And once he does that, you have to obviously sit with the professionals and see what you can do uh, in terms of structuring. I hope that answers your question. But, I mean, a lot of people ask me, what, so what is the standard? Uh, <laughs> what, what, what do I do? Uh, yeah. But the problem is, there is no standard. Uh, there is no. Uh, there is not like one model that works for everybody. If, if that would exist, uh, then uh, every startup would be the same. Yeah. But every every startup situation is different. Every funding situation is different. Every investor is looking for something different. Uh, yeah. So, so once you have determined uh, what kind of investor, what your investor, because I, I would advise them always to speak to your investors. Uh, what what kind of protections do they want? Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe some of them even want uh, more than just equity. Maybe they want equity, and then they want some some other forms of security, actually on your on your IP rights or or your your other assets. That really depends on the investor and what. So very common. specific for each and every case. It's quite a specific. Uh, Think, uh, uh, way of also, running through it, right? Also, for, for you, also to see what do I want to give away, actually? And do I want to only want to give away ordinary shares to the investors? Do I want to give them preferential rights? Uh, how am I protected as the founder? Do I want to uh, maintain a certain level of protection? All that is a is a process of of discussion that you need to have with your advisor and with yourself and your investors. So I think that's a, that's a very key point, isn't it? Um, you know, I think from a founder's perspective it's probably like when i enter into a shareholders agreement it's me giving everything away uh, and maybe the takeaway from this is it's it's not that it's actually me protecting myself and protecting all my co-founders and protecting all of those stakeholders uh, and creating an even playing field if you like where everybody's very comfortable uh, in being in the same place and nobody's got an advantage over everybody else it's, it's a bit sort of back to the the valuation thing as well somewhere where we can all be happy to, to reach an outcome is what we're trying to find all the time. And Well, I mean, uh, uh, building on what Bishir said, uh, I think basically uh, when you're looking at getting a funding round done, first thing is you need to understand the terms. A lot of founders don't even understand the terms. Uh, they just Google, they find something called safe notes and Y Combinator, and then that's the gold standard as far as anything is concerned. Uh, they don't understand how shareholding works. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got founders who come to me and say, I want to capitalize the company at $2 million. I said, why would you do that? Uh, they said, no, because my startup is worth $2 million. Yeah. So they don't understand the concept of share premium. They don't understand the concept of preference shares. I know it sounds very legal, yada, yada, but 
uh, today's day of the internet, if you go to Investopedia and you just Google it, you would be able to understand in a very layman terms that this is what shareholding means. This is what preference shares means. Uh, I had a client who said, uh, you know, I, I need, uh, I don't want ordinary shares. I want preference shares. I said, great. So how many classes? He said, one class, all our preference shares. I said, prefer to what? <laughs> so I think basic ed education, you don't need to take a course. You don't need to go to a fancy school to take a course. Go onto the internet. It's your company. At the end of the day, you are going to give the shares away. You're going to give this uh, thing away. Don't get complicated. Don't feel like this is what's happening in Silicon Valley. So people will enjoy that here. Speak to investors. Speak to the actual persons who are coming in and paying that money and ask them, what do you want? Uh, make it in very... English terms, right? Not not in legal language. Once you have the terms and once you understand what you want to do, go to the advisor. The advisor will put it in the legal language. The advisor will clean it up and then you can take a decision. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I, sorry, if you can just add very quickly, I, I, I fully agree with Rohit over that, that uh, it, is, it is not only the, 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 uh, the, the startup who needs to understand the language, it's also the investor who needs to yeah. understand the language. And we don't have to assume that every investor knows everything about every legal term in a, in a structure. So just if you try to, be as, to simplify what you want to achieve, huh, be as transparent as possible in, your, in terms of your structure, mm -hmm. and then you can take it forward and then approach the investor and he will understand what you want. We've had, we've had clients who had who thought they had safe agreements, uh, who signed the document uh, with investors, and, and at the end of the day, it was basically a promise that in the future, they will enter into a safe agreement. So basically, the investor didn't have anything in their hand. So both sides didn't really understand what they were signing, but they, they thought they were signing something. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. heard. Um, I find the whole um, subject of raising funds, especially for a startup and angel, the first money you're trying to get is very subjective. Every investor is different, every startup is different, every founder is different. There is no set guidelines. So there's a million and one things we can, you know, suggest to the guys who are starting up, to suggest to the guys who are looking to invest. Um, my advice probably would be as much as a shareholder has to do is due diligence on the project that he's investing in. The founders of the project have to do just as much due diligence about the investor. Is it going to help me out? What does he want? What has he done before? Where has he invested? Where is he coming from? And so forth. When we're talking about control and different structures of shares in the company, um, you have to know who you're giving these shares away. It's not just about money because oftentimes you give away a proportion, some portion of your company. Uh, let's say it would be 20%, 25%, whatever jurisdiction it's in. It could be a blocking share. It could be a preferred share and so forth. And you're giving control to somebody who has never done or dealt with anything that your project is doing. They have no idea how to help you. They have no idea how to advise you. They have these votes on what they think you should do as a founder, as a manager of the company, although they've never done it before. All they did is just invest some money into this project. So, uh, like I said, I think it's very important for any startup to do, to find out who your investor is before you approach him. And if you are approached by an investor before you jump in and say, oh my God, thank God he's given us money. Find out who he is, who she, he or he is yeah. before you do that. That's very super valid, qualifying your, your investors at the same time. And understanding, I think what you said is a, is a great takeaway. Understanding what they're bringing to the table. Right. I mean, there's a lot of VCs out there. They're going to bring a whole bunch of X, Y, and Z expertise, introductions, and, and they're very specialized in their vertical, and they can provide it. But the thing I think that you need to clearly understand as well when you enter this is if that VC is a money provider, just a check writer, then that's the relationship. Be happy with that relationship. Don't expect more either. And I often see these sort of things happening. It's kind of like, well, he invested and I want him to do this and I want him to help me. Well, that's not their job. They're in it for the money. And that's clear. They laid it out very clear for you as well. And, and as a startup, you have to treat it as just somebody who writes checks. Yeah. Right. If it's just somebody who writes checks and that's how it's going to stay, then they probably shouldn't have too much control of what's going on. Exactly. It dictates exactly that as well. Right. Yeah. Superb. Um, so now we're going to move on to my favorite bit. <laughs> so now you've managed to do all of this. Now you've, you're out there. You, you've got a, you, you, your pitch deck. Oh, we didn't speak enough about it, but we'll do that in a moment. Um, your pitch deck. Now you're going to go out and you're going to find investors. 
And this this is really uh, what frustrated me and drove me to to build M2, which is a, a, a matching platform um, for for investors and startups to connect them immediately digitally to get those salient conversations going rather than all the uh, wasted coffees, the wasted time, investors that aren't really interested, investors that don't have money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what do you, you got to go through? And this is a, a painstaking job. You've just gone through all those other things. It's taken you several months of your life to actually do that. This isn't, uh, these aren't overnight fixes. Um, they actually take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And whilst you're doing all of this, uh, um, you, you've slowed down building your product at the same time. And now you're going to enter the world of raising capital and finding those investors. Um, <clears throat> it's a full time job. You, you are taking off your, your hat as founder and building a product and you're putting on your hat saying I'm going fundraising. That's my new job. Um, welcome. Um, and this is what you have to do. Essentially, you, you, you have to go and find a load of data. And with that data, whether that be from friends, relationships, your immediate Rolodex, um, coming to places like this, going on, on, on days where you stand up and, and hope to impress someone in 30 seconds. Um, this is bit, basically what you've got to do. Get in front of that audience. The hardest thing, the hardest thing is, to, is to qualify that audience from not seeing anything. Uh, and, and through the last, over the last six to eight months, one of the most surprising statistics I've come across um, when I've been qualifying investors is how few of them actually have money available to put into new startups right now. A lot of investors, a lot of VCs have money, but what's left in their fund is for follow on transactions to existing portfolio companies. They're going to be incredibly happy to talk to you and find out what you're doing because they have existing investments and they want to know what's around the corner, what's coming into that space. So this is one of the things that you need to qualify and be very aware of. Um, before you start a before you start a conversation, um, you know there's a lot of obvious stuff. Can the guy can the guy invest in your jurisdiction? Is he able to invest there? It's the first starting point. If he can't, it's a it's a no go. Um, the product stage where you're actually at. When you reach a slightly later stage, um, the sort of I'm a Series A, I'm a pre Series A, I'm a seed, I'm a B, I'm a what? It's completely meaningless. Um, because we're all we're all different in in different jurisdictions. Silicon Valley, what a what a seed is, it's a it's a five million ticket today. What a seed stage here is is a com completely different. But what the commonality is is where you are within your product. Are you are you ideation stage? Are you an MVP? Are you an MVP with some customers? Have you got slightly more? Are you on the on, on the expansion road? Do you want to go into different countries and expand your model? Um, so this is what you have to understand when you're looking at those guys as well, exactly what they will invest into and, and them just simply saying seed doesn't really mean what it says on the packet. Um, then the industry sector, most, most VCs out there are sort of old school finance uh, and, and they will sort of uh, classify themselves under public markets, um, energy, um, commercial, um, industrial, Etc. Um, so, so doing some sort of back study and understanding what those terms actually mean to know where you fit in. It's not just about your technology at the end of the day and what you're doing. It's actually where you fit into the sort of public uh, understanding of what industry you're actually in. So there's a very good thing you can look at. It's called GICS. It's what public markets um, are basically all classified as. Um, then you've got the technology. Uh, and this is obviously the most interesting part of the whole thing. Um, the way we look at this at N2 is we've split it up into, into four areas uh, to try and deal with what's going on uh, uh, with startups and all the different mo business models that are coming out. Um, so we split it up whether you're B2B, whether you're uh, B2C, X as a service, et cetera, et cetera. What is that business model of today? Um, how you're going to make money essentially and what your marketplace looks like. Um, then we break it down into, in, into the business uh, processes, which is essentially what te underlying technology are you using? Um, and it's very key that, that, that you identify this very clearly. Um, you know, one, one of the things that we see an awful lot of is everybody's clicking the box AI. Everybody apparently is AI. Everybody. Um, yeah, 
it's artificial intelligence. It's not I have an Excel sheet and I'm able to sort some data out. Um, if you're AI, say you're AI, you're developing AI, you're actually using it. But those investors are going to want to see it. So don't just say it if you don't actually have it. Um, and we see this happening an, an awful lot. Um, all these funky terms coming out and we're all doing this. Make sure you actually do what you say you do. Um, and then the next part is the, the domain. What domain are you actually sitting in now? Uh, are you an e-commerce platform? Are you XYZ, construction tech, agri-tech, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so that these, these investors can really understand uh, if you fit into their demographic as well. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's one extra part, and I think this is, this is a, a very attractive part, rather trendy at the moment, but it's to identify where your uh, uh, STGs are, um, if you're, if you're anything that's cultural, uh, essentially, you know, if you're, you're a pure vegan product, if you're a circular economy product, um, because what, what we're seeing in the ecosystem on a global basis is that there are a whole bunch of funds starting off just to go into certain verticals. So uh, why middle class founder, um, specialist fund looking at me, you know, they're breaking every single demographic down. I only eat on a Sunday. Well, there'll probably be a specialist fund for you, uh, for that guy as well, you know? Um, so trying to break that down and match it up. But just to, I mean, just to summarize, it's the enormity of going out and trying to find these investors. You know, the regular guys that we can all go on the, on, on the internet and just click list of VCs, fantastic. Um, but when you realize that the hit rate of a VC investing is one in a thousand, uh, I mean, it sounds like a sort of black swan event if anybody ever raises from a VC. Um, but doing your homework and actually being matched and finding the right guys out there who are struggling as much as you are to find you, um, that's what we built and that's what, that's what you have to do as a, as a founder. Um, so once you've got to that point, <laughs> now you have that list, which means you've been up all night with Excel sheets sorting out data, um, you get to the fun part. <coughs> Yippee, pitching, we all love that, fantastic. Um, and, and you know what the starting point is? We all go on the internet and we go, what should I do? How should I pitch? What should I say? What does this actual thing look like? Um, well, intrinsically, I think we'll all, we'll, we'll all fall on um, someone like Guy Kawasaki, the ex-Apple guy who's the, you know, the king of pitching. And he tells you, this is what you have to do. You, can't, you, you have to have 12 slides. And in those 12 slides, you have to do this. And you just have one line on the screen. And it's 36 font. And, do, and every single founder sees it. And, and that's the only pitch that they ever do. And it's like horses for courses, guys, you know, pitching for the right occasion. Who am I in front of? W which information am I handing over? Um, quick side note here. Um, what's the best way for you to protect your IP? Well, to make sure that your audience is the correct audience and only give a certain amount of information to them and don't spill it all out and document it and hand it over until you've got to the right stage in that conversation with them. That's the way to protect your IP. Um, and, and, and so it's very key that you understand what, what all of those meetings are about and which pitch deck to, to, to bring to, to the game. Um, you know, if you're, if you're having coffees, uh, a two-page teaser is enough just to, just to inspire people. Maybe that's the occasion. If you're in an environment like this, um, um, you know, the 12, the 12 pitch deck guy, Kawasaki example, it's absolutely perfect. Identify what the problem is, tell them about the solution, tell them about the team, et cetera, et cetera. If you're in front of a VC and you've got 12 analysts around the table, um, you bet your bottom dollar they want to go into slightly more detail. There has to be slightly more detail within that pitch as well. You have to go through that. And if you're just sending this out as a diligence pitch, it gets pretty intense and it gets pretty long and it gets pretty deep and you're going to have to include a whole bunch of sub docs in there as well, which are going to show uh, um, all the stuff we spoke about previously, um, um, but also show your financials and your projections within that, your go to market strategy, uh, what your traction is, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's another pitch deck which carries a whole bunch of detail. Um, so I have a yes. question. Uh, actually, I have a question for Igor. Uh, what do you think of, when you're talking about pitching, what do you think of the elevator pitch? 
Do you think it's really the outlet of what? Sorry, the elevator pitch, the one which is like a 30 second, one minute pitch. They say that if you have a pitch which you can sell to a VC in an elevator, then things like that. So, oh, what do you think? Man, this it? is a tough one. Like I said, we've had uh, you know investors approach and just go, "Hey, I need money. Just message me on like Instagram." What? You know, or or somehow find my email. Ah, I need money. You know, um. What would be the perfect pitch? Basically, is that is that where you're no, asking? No, my my question is mainly on on something called the elevator pitch. Elevator pitch, okay. Yes, so they say that you know it's a one one point five minute kind of a teaser, and if you're able to get the attention of the person, then it progresses forward. How what do you feel about it? Do you, does it really work? I think it works. Like I said, it it's subjective. There, it depends who you're pitching it to. If you're pitching it to a huge VC fund. Then they're probably going to be like, well, this is not enough information. You probably lost them at that point because they're never going to come back to you again. If you're pitching a smaller fund, if you're pitching, you know, an investor who has, you know, a couple of million dollars saved up and now he's investing into all these startups, then probably a one minute, one and a half minute kind of short story of what you're doing is in there. Keep it simple because you don't you you like I said, if you if you're just going, you know, to a hundred people and you're pitching them or like, you know, the Bill Gates said, I went to, to a thousand people, you know, 80 of them gave a chance, 20 of them continued the conversation and three of them made me a billionaire, right? So if you're going to a thousand people, you don't know which every single one of those people specialize in. So keep it very simple, do a minute and a half, two minute pitch, maybe a video, a PowerPoint presentation just to get their attention. If you didn't get their attention right away, ask the question. Did you understand what we're doing? Did you understand what our mission is, where we're trying to go with this? If they says yes and I don't like it, then let it go. If they say no, I didn't exactly understand because a lot of investors would actually say, no, for me, this is rocket science. Whatever you're trying to do, you know, I invest into uh, hammers, right? And nails, right? And this is, this, this is what we invest in. I, I I don't know. It, it, it's different for everybody. My partners like, you know, big, pretty, cool videos, graphic designs goes on for 30 minutes. They watch the video presentation, that kind of pitch, then it works for them. For me, I need a minute kind of do I like the idea and then we get into it. Right. I, and then I, I, get I actually have a question uh, that could also go to Igor, uh, but also equally to, to you, Derek, because you mentioned location as one of the important points. Obviously, we're here in the DIFC. Obviously, Igor, you're also here in, in Dubai, so you already have a, a regional focus. But I think the, the in, an interesting question for a lot of startups up to or based here, which which VC uh, funds do I approach? You know, because I am in the Middle East, after all. Right. It doesn't, does it make sense uh, for me to approach uh, the European VCs uh, or the US VCs? Uh, how, how do you see that if, if a startup is based uh, in a certain jurisdiction, yeah, uh, or he has a focus on a certain region. It, how important is that for you to decide on investing in that structure? Or not? It doesn't make much of a difference to me where where the startup is based. Like I said, they can always change jurisdiction after. They can find new corporate structure. They can incorporate in the U.S. They can incorporate offshore. It depends what will save them money. What will be the best uh, fit for the investor they're looking for and for the project itself. Right. Um, I think you can go after any any VC uh, as long as you know you need. And and I wanted to do this during my five minute monologue in the end. Right. You guys, I'm getting all the information now. So in the end, when you're going to ask me to talk, I'm going to be like, well, I already said it all. <laughs> um, you have to realize who your investor is. A lot of the times, it, you know, guys have a certain project, certain idea, certain certain service they want to provide, which is a startup. And then they go to a VC that doesn't even never invested into something like that. Then they're probably going to say no, even if they're here in Dubai. Mm -hmm. Right. But oftentimes I found that I like to invest companies that are based in the same country where I am. And I've lived in geez, six countries by the age of 35. I'm like a gypsy. I'm over around the world. It just so happened to be. I've actually been a year and a half in Dubai. It's like my longest being in a, in a country in the last four countries that I've lived in. But I just moved around with a company that I work for. And uh, I find uh, for me as an investor, it's a lot easier to invest into a project that's local. You know, I can come by the office once in a while, check out how things are doing. And actually I invested into a couple of startups here. One of them is a high tech thing. The other one's actually low tech and investing into some green projects and, as well. 
I find it a lot better for me, but I have invested into projects and startups that are in the US and Russia and Ukraine and so forth. Yeah. And uh, equally, Derek, I mean, obviously in, in N2, you can you can choose location as a, as a factor. How many VC yeah, funds it, have that as a factor, let's say the Middle East or, or do they exclude yeah. the Middle East completely? I mean, we, we, we started the project here. So we we're super focused on, on the MENA region, very quickly got a, because of the connection with South Asia, very quickly opened up to South Asia, et cetera, and took the platform global. Um, you know, what, in, intrinsically, one of the problems here is when you get to later stage, series A, B, um, there isn't really anything here for you, so you've got to go, uh, you've got to search externally, um, which is incredibly difficult for, for guys here. Um, but what we've really seen, um, which is super exciting, uh, uh, for this region is on our discovery and onboarding investors onto the platform more and more and more are happy to look into this region as well. So now, now you know, we, we, we've got Turkish corporate venture capital companies that are now looking into this region. We've got one of the biggest US based guys that basically invested in Asia, Europe uh, and the US has just opened his mandate so he can invest here. Um, you know, so this, this is the discovery we're doing. It's incredibly relevant for um, 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 startups because just finding that guy, that, that US investor, for example, would just be impossible right now because uh, uh, a startup founder, what does he go, go and do? He goes and looks at historical data. The guy hasn't done a transaction here yet. There is no historical data. <laughs> so you'd never find it. So you've got, you got, you got two sides of it here. You know, that investor we're speaking to, he wants to see deal flow from the region. Um, and, and, and of course, founders would love to find him. Um, so that's how we're kind of bringing it together. And a lot of the points you spoke about, you know, what is that vertical? What do I want to invest in? Uh, it's also what we see and it's, it, it's very, very clear. If you're one of the larger established VCs, You've got to raise capital. You've got to raise that on the back of a very, very coherent investment thesis that you have to stay with inside. You have to stay within those boundaries. So they can clearly define what they're going to look at. You have a whole bunch of other uh, uh, investors out there, which are the corporate venture capital guys, global investors. They really don't care where it is. They can invest anywhere, but they're very specific on their vertic vertical. We only do IoT, for example. So any IoT company, wherever they based, wherever they're based, can get an investment or reach out to these guys and find them. And then you have, you know, in, in every economy, you have your angel um, to to seed investment guys, um, and and they're more more what you were saying. You know, I like to get to know the guy, I like to feel it, I like to pop into the office and understand what that business is. Uh, and this sort of entrepreneurial spirit spirit from the investor side is what lives and uh, and keeps that beating heart going, essentially. Yeah. If, if, if I can just add, I think, I think the good thing is that VC funds in general are, are used to investing into high risk, uh, uh, high risk in, uh, no. companies in general. But uh, by actually setting up in the DIFC, I think the advantage of that is you are in a, in a financial free zone which has a certain standing. So basically, if I talk from a legal point of view, of legally structuring, it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. Uh, the information is available in English. Uh, all the information in the register is public information. That means you can go on the public information, you can get the excerpts. If you go to other, other countries in the region, uh, not, not even only in the Middle East, even outside of the Middle East, it might not be available in English, it might be only available in the local language. Uh, you have to translate all the documentation, you have to get uh, trust in that. Here everything is, there is a public register. A lot yeah. of free zones, I mean, you are aware there is not even a public register available. You'd, people ask me sometimes from Europe, like, how do I find information on a company? I told them, like, it's not that uh -huh. easy. <laughs> in the DFC, it's quite easy. So that's, uh, I mean, it's literally why, why we set up in the DFC is because, you know, I'm, I'm from Europe and my investor base was from Europe. And, and they wouldn't invest in me here uh, unless I did it under common law. Mm -hmm. So it's a, don't like the expression very much, but it was a bit of a no brainer <laughs> um, because you can uh, attract investors uh, on a global basis because uh, of the legal jurisdiction that you, you've set up it. Um, so, I mean, are there, are there any points on here that we, we, we would like to expand upon? Um, I think uh, what we spoke about before the conversation, we had a conversation there. Uh, how much do you ask, right? Uh, that part when you're pitching, uh, how do you represent your expenses? 
and 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 are they going to be the same when you were bootstrapped or all of a sudden when you asking for money your expenses go up manifold uh, are you seeing that uh, igor like uh, this is what we were talking about before you came in uh, when we bootstrapped every penny counts but moment you start looking for funding and when you get the funding your cost structure suddenly changes in many places a lot of people start spending much more than they were when they were bootstrapped are you seeing that uh, i don't think i've seen a single business or a startup that has been within its original budget ever right so um i actually wanted to elaborate on point 7 and this is how much we need to pull it off a big part of a business plan and and i'm really cutting into my monologue here the, the, in the end um the big part of a business plan should always be your budget for a month for 6 months for a year and so forth and e- even if you're going for a certain number you can probably multiply it by at least 2 to figure out the right cost is going to take to get there so you also need to realize that before you start giving out giving away shares in which proportion and giving them away because what you think is going to cost you to get your business to a certain point on that grid you know wherever you're going to where you want to get so that that every portion every move that you make needs to be financed and if you give away too much at the beginning then you're not going to be able to get it after and a lot of times your early investors are going to be uh you know what your you know round c d e that they'll, they'll want to get out because they made they made that initial risky investment they want to get out although you'll find some investors that will add that will buy in more into next rounds we've done so with people ai we've done so with discord we've done so with farfetch before remember with farfetch that was already years ago we were public with coursera with udemy we've done it with those we've bought in earlier rounds and then we bought into later rounds because we see that the company has set out the right budget they're fitting in within that budget they're they're getting the things done they're they're supposed to get and they need more money to advance they don't need more money to do what they essentially wanted to do in the beginning they need more money to advance then yes we'll we will continue investing into the business why not yeah the uh, point point 7 is always always one of those uh, uh very interesting areas isn't it uh um you know the the, the dream versus the reality uh and and the reality of executing a plan and getting to that point within a with a within a given budget but the fact of the matter is if if it's going to cost you more that's clear and you should always budget that in on the other side of that vcs do understand it investors always do that as well right so we kind of share this risk between us of i need a bit more money can i have it uh so so that ownership uh, and relationship grows through through those those things but i think this is this is this is one of the points where where i think founders always get a little bit lost uh and that is we want to build everything you know be like Elon Musk of his first project of SpaceX was actually to build the rocket to go to Mars there are steps along the way and there are a lot of steps and you've got to execute them one at a time and hit those targets that's what it's all about we can have the long term visions when you build out build out your fin- financial pro- projections nobody is not tradamus we do not have a crystal ball we can have one year 18 months two years visibility max all we can do after that is wish and hope and extrapolate absolutely That's there, all we could do there's a lot of external factors too you can look at the economy in general now on the financier is me is going to talk for a minute but there's a lot of there there are a lot of factors especially we live in the world like today where money is being printed by tons and you know although we want to ignore it completely but eventually that's going to cause hyperinflation to the US dollar and states eventually it's going to happen it doesn't work any other way or it hasn't worked maybe it will work maybe things changed but it hasn't worked in the last uh, 2021 years and uh you have to realize when you're building a project the wages that you have to pay to the employees that you hire your engineers whatever it is you're doing right if the economical factors change a lot and there is you know a very uh, you know quick rate of hyperinflation those rates will go up you will have to pay double of what you thought you were going to have to pay those engineers mm-hmm. there there there's just so many external factors that you need to consider you, that's why i would say you have to at least double the budget that you came up with first so do you feel with sort of um some of these sort of sy- systemic risks that, that that might be emerging 
Do you feel that's a, a, a function of the VCs to bear in mind when they're looking at valuations? Because on the other side, we're seeing valuations go through the roof and money being put to work, uh, a never increasing pace, right? Or should the founder be really taking that? Both, absolutely both. Uh, I mean, whether it's a, whether it's a startup uh, or it's a huge old public company that exists, you know, you have your systemic risks that are, you know, they're always there. You have to look at them as an investor. You have to look at them as the manager of that company. Uh, they happen, right? And, you know, everybody likes to use the term black swan, right? Nobody's ever seen a swan until, well, they saw that first one and it was black, right? <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, right? But you have to, well, there, there, there's a lot of optimism that goes into VC. There's a lot of optimism that goes into startup. You have to, you know, be positive that things will stay at least on track for the next, you know, 18 to 24 months, like you said, right? And, do, right? and then the company is going to fit into its immediate budgets. Indeed. But I mean, if there's a, do you want to carry on? In, do I, I want I guess, to carry on? I guess, no, I, 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 just, just to say, I guess the, the last thing where you're sitting, what you've recently been through as well, is, is sort of that negotiation term sheet, closing out those deals. Um, Lately, we've been doing a lot of later rounds where we, we've got into, like I said, People AI, beautiful company, great management. The guy is just nuts about what he does. And uh, I've invested into a, a startup here that had funds, built a project, COVID hit, can't find an investor, can't find a buyer because, you know, it's it's high tech, right? And his tech is already a year and a half old. You know, there's there's all these new came up that he needs to rebuild it. So I looked at the project. Uh, maybe do you want to get to the point where I, you know, this is how I pick my investment now or? Uh, that, that'd be exactly, shall we? This is a really big picture of you. Is you it? <laughs> is it? Oh, where is it? Whoa. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of look the same, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's like my one professional edited picture that I have, but quality here is not good. Um, how, how, how we invest, how we pick what to invest. I, I will have to go by points. I didn't make a PowerPoint presentation. I hate PowerPoint presentations. I hate making PowerPoint presentations, right? But you know, sometimes they help you. I kind of go if you're if you're doing a pitch, if you're talking about something, they kind of help you get back on track because you have so many things to say. Yeah. Sometimes you you leave out the important things, and this is very important for a startup when they're doing a pitch as well. Um, first, we look is product or service, product or service, team budget, business plan, and shareholder base, right? If we're not an angel investor or a seed investor, there's been investors before us. We want to know who they are. We want to know why they got in. We, we want to meet them. We want to talk to them uh, and so forth. So if you have a product, you have to look at the market for your product. We're talking about the immediate uh, market, and then we're talking about competitors. When, when I can't come into an invest into a business and they say, well, like I said, there's a problem. We have a solution for it was point one and two. If you actually go back, a yeah, lot of no, what I'm no, going to no. be saying is actually written on that board. I'm just going to be adding a couple more points, right? So uh, there's a problem. Okay, well, you need to figure out how big that problem is. Uh, you have a solution. You have to figure out if you're the only one who has a solution. How many of you guys that have a similar solution? If there's one, two, three competitors in the world, if you're a unicorn, right, or going to become a unicorn, right, uh, you, you know, if you're making that orphan drug that nobody else has come up with yet, right, then you need to know how big your competitors are. You need to know how your competitors work about. Are they aggressive competitors or are they, you know, passive? You know, they, they made a product, they made a service, they kind of carry on, they expand their business, or they're aggressive where they're going to, you know, help you not succeed as well as you wanted to or, you know, try and take you out in earlier stages, maybe buy you out or maybe do something that will make your life a lot, you know, harder, um, you know, make prices a lot cheaper that will just drive you out of business. You need to know who those competitors are and how they behave. Uh, shareholder structure, right? Uh, a lot of businesses, I, I get a lot of pitches. A lot of people come to us and go, I have an idea. I want to 3D print an autonomous blockchain on Mars, right? That's what everybody's doing. AI, big data, you know, boom, make your brain melt. Oh, and all the ideas, yeah. And and I go, well, 
essentially, I specialize in investing into transport companies, logistics, supply chain, stuff like that. Uh, delivery robots is like the one thing I'm really excited about right now. You know, just literally fix a lot of last mile deliveries and all that stuff. That's really important. And, you know, when somebody comes up to me with that project, you know, a 3D printed blockchain um, automated on Mars, I go to them. I have the money to invest into your project. I think it's cool, but I wouldn't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. I can't help you. So when you're looking for an investor, I think one very, very important subject, can your investor help you? Not just by giving you money. Can they help you raise future funds? Can they help you get your product to the market? Can they help you, uh, you know, work out things with your competitors, with your suppliers? Can they, there's so many things to help you out with the whole supply chain of things, right? When you're, when you're starting a project, very, very important. For budgeting, we already covered it. I had a big whole thing I wanted to talk about budgeting. It's very important in the startup. Uh, everybody always underestimates how much money they need for a project. Always. I haven't seen a single exception to that. You know, and, and again, you know, when it's a startup, oh, you realize that, let's say you need $5 million to carry on for the next two years to hire the team that you need uh, for this project. Uh, we talked. We talked about systemic risks and and whatnot. Let's say you need to double that amount, but you're not going to come up to a VC. You're not going to come up to an angel investor and say we need ten million dollars. But right now, you know we're we're a small free zone company in Fajera, right? The investor is going to say, well, ten million dollars really is that where you want to get at? So you want you want to divide your initial budgeting, and you want to say, well, we need to corporate, we need to hire a lawyer, we need to hire an advisor, uh, we need to do a lot of research on the market, on the on a product, and so forth. How much is going to cost? Um, start small, right? So let's say right now we need fifty thousand dollars to incorporate and hire an advisor. Then we need $100,000 uh, in order to, you know, do the research of the market that we're getting into. Then we need $500,000 to hire a team that will work, you know, three, four guys that will work for the next year. If it's like, you know, something high tech, technology, coders, whatever it is, you know, it costs a lot of money. These guys are very smart and they're getting paid for what they do. You, you have to know that it's going to cost you a lot of money. Staff is always the most, you know, the biggest your team is always going to be your biggest expense, no matter what business you're in. It's always going to be your biggest expense, right? Because if you want to get big, bigger, better, faster, stronger than somebody else, then you need to hunt those heads, right? That know how to do this. And they're always going to cost you a lot more than you think right now they're going to cost you, which is, which is, which is a big issue for, for startups. So my uh, suggestion would be, don't come out to an investor and say, we need $10 million right now to make this happen. Come out and say, we need a million to make this happen, a million to make this happen, two million to make this happen, and above and so forth. Right. And, is, and of course, you know, once you move along, uh, I, I've seen, I've seen uh, a lot of ventures that start off and say, we, we need a budget of 10 million. And they don't realize that today for that 10 million, they need to give away, let's say, 40% of their company. If you're doing 100,000, 500,000, a million smaller, with every step that you take and that money that you spend from the investors, the value of your company grows. So if you give your first 1% for 1 million or 10% for 1 million, at your next stage where you already advanced in the process, the same million is only going to be 1%. And the next step, that million is only going to be one tenth of a percent of your business because you're moving along. But that's also, but that's also really, really key and super important to do yeah. for both sides of, of this, right? Absolutely. It's to make sure, you know, one of, one of the biggest things I, I say, and I'm guilty of this as well, is we get caught, we get caught in the sort of um, development paralysis. And it, it, it's that horrible zone where you live and you go, but I need to just add on this new feature to get these users. And no, no, you said your roadmap was this, and you said that your go-to-market strategy was this, and you needed to build these tools in order to do this full circle. Uh, and CTOs are always coming back, and, and, and the sort of CVO, the chief visionary officer is sitting there, but I need this, and I need this, and the sales guys can't do that, and we can't market that unless we have this. And, and I think this is a bit... A big reason as well for going over budget yeah. is as you go along that development route, you always want the next new toy, 
it's if, a big you, if you got a lump sum of money, uh, it goes well. Tempted to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. We 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 got ten million dollars to do this. Uh, let's buy you know five thousand dollar chairs because they're economically so better needed. for us, right? And so forth. <laughs> we'll still have uh, nine hundred or nine million and one hundred ninety five thousand left. But, no, right. This, this That's is, what it is. So it, it, I think this is true for the entire structure. I mean, if, yeah. if for an entire startup, uh, you, you you start simple uh, and you you give yourself options. And I'm not speaking personally. I'm speaking from 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 the legal structure. Yeah. You, you you can start at simple, and then in the future you can build up to some piece being more complex and have more complexity in the whole structure. And the same is is for your application. You can and I prefer in any whether it's a fund, whether it's a startup, whether it's any business, it's better to start simple, and then you can upgrade that structure to something more complicated at the end of the day. Every uh, uh, Every point of the business, as you said, because because everything moves so quickly, and what suits you yesterday doesn't necessarily necessarily suit you tomorrow. Growing this stuff organically, dynamically, being on top of it, uh, and moving with new investors as they come on board and bring different value propositions to you as well. Getting into that feedback loop, getting into that go-to-market strategy, uh, uh, and letting yourself be able to organically push your company and grow that company is. As long as you know you go along the way, you you come up with better ideas, right? Like let's say your original idea was a certain way, and then once you get going at it, and you realize, hmm, or the technology comes out that lets you enhance it, and it turns into a completely different project, which could probably have a better market share and cost more and be more profitable and so forth. So so like you said, start small and build it out. And, Right. And then you have to give away with every step. You have to give a much smaller portion of your company because you're now a couple of heads ahead, a couple of, sorry, a couple of steps ahead from when you originally wanted that lump sum. Yeah. So I guess the, uh, the, 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 there's a million and one things to say. There's, they're all, yeah, they're, 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 they're all so subject. different. Uh, yeah, it would have been a lot easier, you know, with live audience asking questions, this and that, wow. and yeah, we could be here for hours, I guess. Yeah. But I guess the key takeaway and, uh, uh, for any startup founder has to be yeah. save yourself a lot of, a lot of stress, a lot of agony by, by set, putting your ducks in order at the beginning of this, um, understanding what the terminology is out there, understanding how you're going to actually uh, find those investors and what those conversations are going to be, what they're going to look like, what they want. Um, I, th I think that's really it, but concentrate at the beginning of your journey on, on making sure that you've ticked all the boxes and that you're ready to go and you understand that. Uh, and that's going to save you a lot of energy um, when you get that investor in front of you who wants to invest and then does some diligence and says, sorry, son, you didn't do this. I'm going to add one more point and I forgot to add in every conversation that we have with every founder, with every team, with every engineer, you're all biased. You're all biased towards your project. It, it's always that. It's your baby, yeah. right? This is your project, your idea. You're biased. You value it a lot more than any than a lot of VCs and investors would because you have this vision. And I, I wouldn't say that you're not thinking straight. You're thinking straight. You're a smart man, woman, or uh, you're, you're in business. You have the experience. You have the education and so forth. But you're biased. And you're going to understand the people that you're approaching, they're always going to be looking at your project in a different light. For them, it's a project that somebody that they just saw for the first time a minute ago that you pitched it to them. Like I said, it's like a baby. You know, when you have a baby, it's your <laughs> baby. You love it. You're crazy about it. But, you know, your your sister comes to your house. It's her nephew. Yeah, she loves it, but it's new. She just saw it. And she's kind of like, well, you know, she love it more with time. Right. But exactly. it's exactly the way it is. And you have to understand that when you're pitching something to an investor, they don't feel crazy, but your project may be yet. Maybe they never will, but they probably not for a long time feel about it the way that you do. Mm -hmm. Right. And they will value it completely differently than you do. So you have to always keep that bias in mind. And for a founder, I guess, uh, before you walk into, into any of those meetings, Make sure you have really, really thick skin, incredibly thick skin. There's going to be a lot of rejection, a lot of no's along the way. Well, I'm, I'm very, very, very straight up when I talk to people that, you know, come to me for financing or for investment, very straight. But I, I think it's the best experience they're going to get. If if I'm going to be like, oh, I don't know, I'll call you. I don't know this, that. Yeah, no, no that, that's, that's one of the worst answers ever. Yeah, I mean, you either want to sort of, yes, let's take it to the next level, or that's the most stupid idea I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Um, but the one in the middle, which is, uh, I like to call it the open option, maybe I missed something, which is, 
yeah, I kind of see how this could work. And maybe, hey, you know what? Get back to oh, me in oh. a month. Yeah, and it just keeps you hanging on. Founders have never been in here ever in their life. They've never been in this situation. So they take that false hope with them and they hang on it. Yeah. And they think, right, well, we're going to close this funding round because Bob said he kind of liked it. Uh, it's not really on, on on board. But, you know, and I, I think that's one of the great, just to, just to round this off with a bit of DIFC and what they're doing here, I think it's one of the great things that they can establish and help with that ecosystem is you're housing everyone in the same place now. So founders can go and talk to other founders, say, how, how do you feel about that that guy? And investors can get that feedback as well and just, you know, just try, and, just try and put it out there on a more harmonious level for everybody to uh, yeah. to, to, to converse and move forward. Absolutely. So. Perfect. Fantastic. Wrap it up. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I hope you uh, learned something and there's some value in there. Yeah. For you? Well, uh, that's it. Uh, just to round off, uh, we have uh, to all the registered attendees sent you a link which has an uh, exclusive podcast, a series of three podcasts uh, for a guide to, for startup guide to VC financing. That's something which you can listen to. It's 30 minutes uh, broken down into consumable 10 minute slots. So please uh, l listen to that. And I think Derek has something from the N2 platform, I think is giving a bit of a freebie. Bit of a freebie. If you're uh, if you're in fundraising stage or you're going to get into fundraising stage, please come and visit us. We have a we have a free section on there where you can uh, upload your raise onto it. You can see how many investors you can be uh, matched to, uh, and there's a there's a payment section. But we're giving giving a promo code on that. So if you want to reach out to investors on n2.eco, please visit. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Thanks. Thanks very much. Oh. Thank you.